Good to see all of you here. Welcome. We, we haven't decided what to call this. If we call it uh, this afternoon or this evening at 2 o'clock, we called it this morning and both. So we're just going to call it Merry Christmas and welcome you here in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ whose birth we celebrate. On this day, and and we know that you've uh, many of you have traveled to to be with family and friends, and we're so grateful that you've carved out a slice of your day to worship the Lord with us today. And we hope and pray that you'll be blessed that you came. We know that you will be, and we're so excited because our God is here. He's among us. He came to this earth to show us the great love that He has for us. And I'm going to invite you now to stand to your feet with a very appropriate uh, opening hymn as we sing, O Come All Ye Faithful. Let's stand together and sing. Tidings of great joy, which shall be to all people. Glory to God. For unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior, which is Christ the Lord. Glory to God in the highest, and on earth peace and good will for all. A reading from the book of the prophet Isaiah. The people walking in darkness have seen a great light. On those living in the land of deep darkness, a light has dawned. You have enlarged the nation and increased their joy. They rejoice before you as people rejoice at the harvest, as warriors rejoice when dividing the plunder. For as in the day of Midian's defeat, you have shattered the yoke that burdens them, the bar across their shoulders, the rod of their oppressor. Every warrior's boot used in battle and every garment rolled in blood will be destined for burning. 
will be fuel for the fire. For to us a child is born, to us a son is given, and the government will be on his shoulders. And he will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. Of the greatness of his government and peace, there will be no end. He will reign on David's throne and over his kingdom, establishing it and upholding it with justice and righteousness from that time on and forever. The zeal of the Lord Almighty will accomplish all this. Throughout the Advent season, we have lit the candles of peace, hope, and love. And tonight, of course, on Christmas Eve, we get to light the Christmas candle. In those days, Caesar Augustus issued a decree that a census should be taken of the entire Roman world. This was the first census that took place while Quirinius was governor of Syria. And everyone went to their own town to register. So Joseph also went up from the town of Nazareth in Galilee to Judea to Bethlehem, the town of David, because he belonged to the house and line of David. He went there to register with Mary, who was pledged to be married to him and was expecting a child. While they were there, the time came for the baby to be born. And she gave birth to her firstborn, a son. She wrapped him in cloths and placed him in a manger because there was no guest room available for them. That night, there were shepherds staying in the fields nearby, guarding their flocks of sheep. Suddenly, an angel of the Lord appeared among them, and the radiance of the Lord's glory surrounded them. They were terrified, but the angel reassured them. Don't be afraid, he said. I bring you good news that will bring great joy to all people. The Savior, yes, the Messiah, the Lord, has been born today in Bethlehem, the city of David. And you will recognize him by this sign. You will find a baby wrapped snugly in strips of cloth, lying in a manger. Suddenly, the angel was joined by a vast host of others, the armies of heaven, praising God and saying, Glory to God in highest heaven and peace on earth to those with whom God is pleased. When the angels had returned to heaven, the shepherds said to each other, Let's go to Bethlehem. Let's see this thing that has happened, which the Lord has told us about. They hurried to the village and found Mary and Joseph, and there was the baby lying in the manger. After seeing him, the shepherds told everyone what had happened and what the angel had said to them about this child. All who heard the shepherds' story were astonished. But Mary kept all these things in her heart and thought about them often. The shepherds went back to their flocks, glorifying and praising God for all they had heard and seen. It was just as the angel had told them. Let's pray together. Lord, we thank you for the birth of your son. Help us to prepare again for his coming. To prepare inwardly in our hearts and outwardly in our world. We do not only commemorate the birth of Jesus, but celebrate His presence and His continued rebirth in our hearts. We not only celebrate the meaning of His life for our world, but rejoice at His continued presence and involvement in it. We thank You for that moment 2,000 years ago, and for this moment, and for those to come when the miracle happens again. And the unseen, unheard, but not unknown occurs. And He is here and with us yet again. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So let's pray for our offering as we prepare to receive it. Lord, we thank You for the gifts that You have given to us. And as we celebrate the gift of Your Son in this world, we hope to offer back to You a portion of what You've blessed us with. And we ask today that You would use those gifts to further your kingdom in this world, and to spread the light of Christ. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Let the ushers please come forward. Let's pray for our pastor as he comes to share the message tonight with us. Lord, we thank you so much for filling Pastor Mike with your Holy Spirit. And we know, Lord, that you have a message to give to each of us through his words. Lord, we ask that your spirit would open the ears and eyes and the very deepest part of our hearts today. It's in Christ's name that we pray. Amen. 
Merry Christmas. And in the name of Jesus Christ and on behalf of his loving and caring church, I, and on behalf of Keith and I, I want to welcome you all to Christmas at Marion Methodist. It's such a thrill to see some of you that have been away for a while that don't live in our community anymore or who have uh, been at college come back and worship with us at Christmas. It's a blessing to, to see you. Your Christmas sermon uh, is as follows. It was just before noon, but he was completely, completely convinced that the darkness of the deepest corner of his closet would completely conceal him. So when I threw open the doors, our eyes locked. He stood frozen like a statue. I said, Michael, you're it, to my little four-year-old nephew. He was completely perplexed. He said, Uncle Mike, how did you see me in here? Because he'd hidden himself in the closet when it was dark. The little four-year-old mind did not grasp that the light of the room would overtake the darkness of the closet. He thought it might be the other way around. He didn't have the life experience that you and I have. He was unaware that in every circumstance, when light comes in contact with darkness, light prevails. Every time. Every single time. Light prevails. You see, the eve of Christmas is not a celebration of the darkness. It's true that on this light night, we we love the dark and we love it when this room gets dark. But not because we love the darkness, not because we want to embrace the darkness. It's because we love this light. It's because we love that light and all that it represents. We love as human beings the light and we love this light in specific because what it symbolizes is spectacular. 27 centuries ago, the prophet Isaiah wrote, The people walking in darkness have seen a great light. You heard Keith read that just a few moments ago. And then, to add emphasis to those words, his very next sentence says, Those living in a land of deep darkness. To them a light has dawned. Nothing is more pleasant when you're in the darkness than to have light come into it. And the darkness the prophet Isaiah is speaking of was not of a dark night, not of a darkness that could be eradicated by torches or candles or a roaring fire. No, the darkness that he speaks of is the, is the darkness of our lives, the darkness that's present even in the midst of the midday sun. The darkness is the darkness that hovers over and envelopes our spirits. This is the darkness that makes a human being feel alone or broken or hopeless or lost. This deep darkness cannot be penetrated by hundreds of halogen floodlights. This is the deep darkness of our souls that makes us feel trapped by death and despair. And it's into this deep darkness... That God doesn't just send a bright light. He promises to send light. Obviously, we know that when you shine light into a darkness, it makes it go away. True enough, but in the Christmas story, the story that our two high school seniors just read for you a few moments ago, God is not addressing the darkness that comes by and goes away, every, that comes by every time the sun sets in the western sky. God knows and knew to bring light to the human heart and to our soul, there's not enough incandescence in this world. So God does not send just a flickering light into our darkness. He doesn't send a thing into the darkness that consumes humanity. He sends himself. He sends a person. God's light comes to us through a child. That is Christmas. Surely you know the story of the birth of Jesus in Bethlehem. The prophets prophesied it. The Hebrews longed for it. And two millennia ago, it happened. It was beautiful. Absolutely beautiful. The images in our minds, the figurines and the nativity sets, the raising of lit candles in a few moments, the words of scriptures, carols, and all the wonderful music that we've had tonight paint this beautiful picture of the day that God stepped into the darkness of humanity as Jesus. The light of our and every other world. It's a beautiful scene. And more importantly, it's an incredible scene. An incredible scene. 
See, the eve of Christmas is famous all around the world. And we fill sanctuaries, not because of the beautiful portrait of a young family. There are many of those in the world, including yours. We fill sanctuaries tonight because we know something. We fill sanctuaries tonight because we know darkness. We know darkness in our lives. And in this incredible child, this Jesus, the light that comes will consume our darkness if we allow it to shine. The birth is incredible because this firstborn of the virgin is the second person of the Holy Trinity, which is to say our God comes in human form. There in the manger, manger, the infinitely powerful becomes weak. The wonderfully majestic becomes humble. The creator of the universe becomes one of us. The infinite, eternal, self-sustaining being who made every atom in the universe and then put them in their places and spun them in in motion becomes dependent on a human mother. A mother that he himself had made. Incredible. Absolutely incredible. And he became one of us. And he's to be known by the name. Wonderful Counselor. Mighty God. Everlasting Father. Prince of Peace. Let me take just a few moments of your Christmas Eve to share what each one of those means. To call him wonderful means that he is supernatural, extraordinary, and there's nothing about him that is common. He is far beyond our comprehension. We will never understand him, but he can be known through a little child born to Mary and Joseph. And to call him counselor is to acknowledge his involvement in our lives. Good counselors always seek to know well those that they advise, help, guide, and lead. Our God is the only God in in all philosophy and all religion who loves his people or makes claim that he loves his people enough to come, be as one of us, live with us, and get intimately involved in our lives. He is the wonderful counselor. And Jesus is the mighty God. To call Him that means that He is strong and invincible, able to defeat any enemy that comes, and He is unafraid of any that come. He has the power to protect us from the wickedness of Satan's evil, and, importantly to those of us in the North American world, He has the power to protect us from ourselves. See, this child of... Bethlehem, this mighty God, has the power to protect us even from our own foolish minds, our own wayward ideas and actions, something that many of us have on our own designs proved ourselves incapable of doing. And this mighty God has the power to preserve even when our strength fails. Our humanity is certainly sturdy. We know that. And yet often when faced with deep hardship of mind, of spirit, or relationship, we cry out, I'm done. I quit. I give up. But the mighty God who comes at Christmas never gives up. He never gives in. In fact, He inserts His strength in our lives when our strength fails. And He has the power to provide. Sometimes in the face of absolute impossibility, each of us will, each of us especially that has risen to adulthood, each of us will and has come into moments for which we have no answer for the problems that face us. They they seem impossible. They seem beyond us. And everything seems lost. From everything I'd heard, Rita was a vivacious, beautiful 40-year-old woman when her 15-year-old daughter, Chris, took her own life. When I met Rita, that's not what she was. She was weary, ragged, constantly anxious, depressed, hopeless, 42 years old, but looking at least 20 years older than what her birth certificate would record. She told me that her life was impossible. She had no answers. And all she wanted to do was join her daughter in death. I had no single word. I had no combination of words. I had no magic incantation that would provide her any counsel or convince her any differently. I did not have that within me. And then by what I believe to be a nudge of the Holy Spirit. I invited her to come to our Sunday night youth program and, and help with crowd control. I just needed help with crowd control. But, but out of character, and I, I had a first, second, third plan for this job, she had said no to so many, many things at the church that we tried to get her involved with, and she said yes. Because unbeknownst to me, 
And unbeknownst to her and unbeknownst to anybody else, God was providing her with a possibility in the midst of her impossible life. I didn't give her a hard job that night. Rita was assigned to stand by the door and basically keep the kids that like to wander away from the mass inside the building. That was her joy. And at the end of the night, she came running up to me, literally running up to me, tears running down her cheeks, staining the blouse that she was wearing on her shoulders and said, Pastor Mike, I've talked to a few of these kids that were trying to escape and they really, really need help. They're so sad. They seem so hopeless. They're depressed. And they feel like life is impossible, just like Chris did. Just like I did when I came here tonight. I've got to help. I've got to do something. You see, God provided Rita with the possibility inside the midst of her impossible that day. Today, if you googled Larita Archibald and suicide, you would find that she's the preeminent speaker for suicide prevention, survival, and teen heartbeat in the state of Colorado. For her, everything seemed impossible and lost, and God provided her a possibility that no human could possibly arrange. God provides for us because He is the mighty God. And the mighty God has the power to promote us. He came to take us home to be with Himself. See, that's the whole deal with God. God wants us to be at one with Him. He wants to be with us forever. He comes to promote us beyond humanity's greatest enemy, which is human death. It's undefeated against us. You know that. He comes as a child, he grows to a man whose goodness and purity offended the world so much they chose to to kill him. Rather than rising from what he deserved, from cradle to a crown, to sit at the high point in the city of Jerusalem on the throne, he rose from cradle to a cross and was killed just outside the walls of Jerusalem. But you see, death in the grave could not hold Jesus. It had nothing to offer him. So he defeated both death and the grave and offers the same victory here, now, and everywhere to you. He offers that same promotion to you, me, and anyone who would believe in him. Because he's the mighty God. And he can make it happen. And he is the everlasting father. And to call him the everlasting father means that he exudes the character traits of what a good father is to be. You know, maybe not all of us had great dads. I did, but maybe not all of you did or do. But you do have an everlasting Father in Jesus Christ who loves you unconditionally and is constantly present with us. Everywhere we go, He is. He will never abandon any of us, though He gives us the privilege to abandon Him. He is everlasting, which means that there's never been a time when He was not, and there will never be a time when He is not. Therefore, if you receive Him, if you welcome his, Him as the light of the world who comes as a child into your heart, you're guaranteed a forever with your Father. And He shows Himself to be the Prince of Peace. Perhaps the greatest benefit of all salvation to me is peace. Peace of mind, heart, spirit, soul, all of it. Our worlds, whatever they are, whatever world you live in, whatever world I live live in, is filled with dissonance and conflict and hardship. And we want peace. We crave peace. One of the greatest privileges I had to in my young life was to meet Pete Maravich, who was, if you don't know, one of the best men to ever play the game of basketball. Though his college career at Louisiana State ended 45 years ago, he is still the all-time leading scorer before there was a three-point line in college basketball. He's a member of the Basketball Hall of Fame. And yet, in his autobiography, he describes what many would consider a storybook life of extreme talent, incredible wealth, and fame as complete misery. His soul was constantly tormented, and he tried everything to find peace. He tried drugs, he tried alcohol, he tried meditation, he tried philosophy. He tried everything in his quest for peace. Nothing would give him any relief. And so one night after tucking his kids into bed, he he lay beside his wife sleeplessly in bed. At 4 a.m., his mind was racing with horrible thoughts, and he remembered a basketball camp that a teammate of him had, in his words, tricked him into helping him with. It was a campus crusade for Christ basketball camp. 
And Maravich clearly remembered turning a deaf ear on every speaker and even making fun of their lame appeals to receive the peace of Christ. But that morning, 4 a.m., covered with sweat, in a complete anxiety attack, November of 1982, Pistol Pete Maravich got out of bed, knelt down on the floor, and prayed to God, I've punched you, I've kicked you, I've cursed you, I've used your name in vain, I've mocked you, I've embarrassed you, I've done everything bad that I possibly could, and you promise me you'll forgive me, will you? Help me have peace in my life. And within a moment, Pete Maravich said he felt something he had never felt before. Absolute peace washed over his whole person. His mind came to rest and for the remainder of his life he proclaimed to anyone who would hear him that Christ had provided him with a peace that reigned in his heart and was completely ruled by, by, by the Lord and no chaos existed in him. And I'm here to tell you tonight, the same is available to you if you receive Christ as the light of your life. See, without Christ our lives are marked with fear and hopelessness. When He's our light... Peace overcomes all that. Chaos flees and peace reigns. That's the news at Christmas. You know, throughout this month, up to this day, in this pulpit, we've been asking the question, who gets the news? Martin Luther, who lived 500 years ago, asked two questions that will bring me to the end of my Christmas Eve message and will answer for you what the news is. In his Christmas sermon the year 1530, Martin Luther asked this, For whom was he born and whose Savior is he? Jesus was born for all the faint-hearted who feel the burden of sin. He was born for all who let their lives get out of control or have been sent spinning out of control by circumstances of their own making or those they cannot control. He was born for every person in every category of every culture, past, present, and future. He was born for those who accept him into his life. Simply, he was born for you. He was absolutely born for you, and He was born for me. He is your Savior. He is my Savior if you desire to be saved. And I encourage you, I admonish you, let Him be the light of your world. In the very same sermon five centuries ago, Luther asked this, Why did God do all of this? Why did He do it? He was born into the circumstance of our world so that light and joy could overcome darkness. He is born into your joys, your celebrations, your sorrows, your griefs. He was born into your hopes, your fears, your words, your silences. He's born into your successes and accomplishments. He's born into your failures and disappointment. He's born into your life. Because that is where you need His presence. You don't need a figurine on a nativity. You don't need the glistening light of a candle. You don't need a story that's playing out on Charlie Brown's Christmas story. You need a presence in your life. You need the light of the world to illuminate your life, to bring His love and, your, and His healing into your soul. And He's born for that. He's born so that you may see the light of God. No other thing. He is born that all may see the light of God. And that's why I can say to you, with the clearest of consciences this night, if you put your life in His hands, if you allow Him to be the light in your darkness, it is appropriate for me to say to you, Merry Christmas. So my dear friends, in the name of the One who comes to be the light of the world, in the One who comes... And the only one who can truly make Christmas an every day, Mary, I say to you, Merry Christmas. Amen. Praise the Lord. Alleluia. The light of Christ comes to us. And of course, as we come to these moments, we love when we can celebrate that coming. You've been handed a candle on your way in today, I hope. Some real. Some have battery-operated lights on them. I don't fear a thing from those of you with batteries. But we're seated in a 120-year-old building. Yeah, so it's too late for all that. We were already building a new one, but... Uh... And you have your best clothes on. 
And so remember, if you've got a lit flame, just, just keep it upright, and others that are going to light from you uh, can tip theirs. That's enough instruction. There is a litany for our candlelight service as we turn to it now, uh, to the celebration of the light of the world. The people who walked in darkness have seen a great light. You are the light of our world. Be light in our darkness, O Christ. Tonight we light these, coal, can, these candles and hold them high as a symbol. We light these candles to proclaim that Christ is the light of our lives. Let us celebrate that truth.
verses we have to extinguish these lights to go, we remind ourselves that the power of God, the light that comes through our world is way stronger, way more incandescent than anything we can hold in our hands. So friends, let us extinguish these lights. Let the light of the world continue to shine in your lives. And if you wouldn't mind on the way out, if you drop these in the boxes, that'd be great. But before that, let's sing the praise of Christmas. Let's stand and sing Joy to the World. that joy of our Savior who has come to this world. Let that light that you've experienced tonight go with you tonight. Merry Christmas. God bless you.